our next generations, people who are going to university and they are being bombarded by ideas, by material, by sciences, which are totally secular. They just uproot them. They still pray, they still do the, their, their ibadat, but they are intellectually totally cut off from the Islamic civilization. There is a schizophrenia inside, and some of them just go out of deen because they cannot reconcile these two things. 1.7 billion human beings testifying to the two attestations of Islam, but most of them totally uprooted from the Islamic thought and civilization for ourselves, for our next generations. When the professor at the university asked them to write an article or a term paper on jihad, on women, on beauty, on, on anything about is in, within Islam, where do they go? They go to the reference works produced by those who do not believe in this book. In 1913, one Jewish company started the first encyclopedia of Islam called the Islam Encyclopedia of Islam. This is 2014 and we still have that same company's encyclopedia all over the world in all universities. We have translated that terrible work into Arabic, into Urdu, into Turkish, into Bhasha, into Farsi. In some cases, on gunpoint, this terrible man who used to throw ulama from the helicopters in Turkey, he ordered the Turkish Department of Education to translate that terrible work into Turkish. And that work, if you go into the entry of Muhammad, alayhi salatu it says, quote, unquote, 1913, Encyclopedia of Islam, it says about the Quran that this is the book of Muhammadans. Listen to this. Book of Muhammadans produced in secrecy by Muhammad who would not who would not disclose the method of production of this book. But from external sources, we know that he was epileptic. And in fits of epilepsy, he would write these, th these verses. 1913, the Muslim world was totally dead in 1913. There was not a single country where somebody would wake up and say, what are you saying? But in 1960, they produced the second edition of the same work in which they removed some of the uh, most apparent distortions. But they kept, they kept the essential fundamental belief that this is a human work. 2005, they did something extraordinary. They produced the first encyclopedia of the Quran. And in that encyclopedia, if you look at the article on Revelation, it says that the first revelation that came according to a consensus of the Muslim tradition. Listen to this word, these words. This is from the quote from the encyclopedia of the Quran, 2005. According to the consensus, ajma, of the Muslim tradition, the first revelation that came to the Prophet ﷺ came on a piece of cloth, embroidered on which was Ikra Bismi Rabbi Now, who says this is the consensus of the Islamic tradition? The consensus of the Islamic tradition is that this was an oral transmission. Now, most Muslims would have no clue what is, what is being done here. Number one, they are claiming on our behalf that our tradition has this consensus. So anyone who does not know, even from the Muslims, who doesn't know what is the consensus of the Ummah, based on authentic hadith, both in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim, they will say, well, this is the consensus. Number two, they will then go after finding that piece of cloth, as they did in the case of this so-called Quran from the Yemen. There is a research project now going on, trying to find the oldest manuscript of the Quran, so they can prove that the Quran we have is not the same Quran that was revealed. They are reducing the oral transmission to material transmission. Now in Islam, this is a fundamental aspect. In Islam, it is the oral transmission that is authentic. This recitation, beautiful recitation you heard today, where does it come from? This brother learned orally from his sheikh who learned orally 
from his chair, from his teacher, from his teacher, eventually to the Prophet The authenticity within our tradition is based on oral transmission, heart to heart, person to person, generation to generation. In their system, it is the written text. It is the written text that has the value. It's a fundamental civilizational difference. They are reducing our fundamental method of transmission, distorting it to material transmission. Those who understand this difference will realize how dangerous this thing is. The article on the wives of the Prophet Ummahat al Mumineen, our mothers, says that this was a power hungry lot vying for the sexual and material attention of the Prophet This is so-called academic work. All over the Western world, this encyclopedia is sitting in every single library. What are we going to do about it? Are we going to go out and burn these books and break our own windows and break our own houses and burn our own buildings? No, that's not going to change it. We need to produce an equally scholarly text, deeply anchored within our own tradition and executed at the highest level of academic scholarship and put it next to their, their, their encyclopedia and let the researcher go and look at the two, both in terms of depth of scholarship, beauty of production, beauty of references, and the encyclopedic style. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspired me in somewhere in 2007. I woke up with this one night with this idea. Produce a list of 600 entries covering all concepts, places, persons, things, and events mentioned in the Quran, sent it around the world to scholars for one whole year. One whole year, this list was going everywhere, from Syria to Brunei Darussalam to scholars who looked at it, suge made suggestions, merged these two entries, you are missing this, add this, subtract this, finalize the list, 585 articles, divided equally into six volumes, and started this project without any material resources. This was, this was sheer mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala realizing that that terrible work started in 1913 is still ruling the academic world. People are still going to that work to draw information and knowledge about Islam. Since then, brothers and sisters, it has been an amazing journey of belief, of faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy and du'as of countless people across the world for this project. And it is really sh his mercy and blessings that we have this first volume in a state of almost total lack of material resources. There are people in this world, Muslims, who would spend 10 times the amount of money that has gone into the making of this first volume in one night on the birthday of their daughter or son. You go to the Middle East and you see these terribly twisted buildings popping up from the earth, tall buildings leading to the belief that really the signs of the end are here because this is what was foretold by the Prophet ﷺ, that they'll be vying with each other to make these tall buildings, these shepherds. But we want to, we want to, we have a, we have a, we have a, we have no option here because our Prophet upon him peace and blessings, told us, if you see the sign of Qiyam and you have a sapling in your hand, plant it. We have to plant it. No matter how dark the situation is, we have to light the candle. Allah's nur is preserved forever, but our understanding of that nur, our understanding of this book, our the understanding of our next generations of this book depends on opening paths to this beautiful ocean of knowledge in a language that they can understand. So you will find in this first volume that every single statement that is being made 
is immediately referenced back to one of the primary sources. And most of these references come from the first five or six centuries of Islam. From the greatest scholars beyond sectarian divide, when nothing had yet happened of this kind, what we have now. A scholarly text that brings the flavor of that tradition in a language that is flawless, in a, in a manner that is encyclopedic, which means that we take a concept, the concept of beauty, for example, we look at all the verses which mention the concept of beauty, beauty of this world, beauty of the hereafter, beauty of the animals when they come back, the spiritual beauty, the physical beauty, all of these verses, come. we put them together, we look at hundreds of tafasirs, what scholars have said, we look at books of hadith, we look at books of fiqh, and produce a, an extract from this whole great tradition and present it encyclopedically. The animals articles, the, all the 33 animals mentioned in the Quran, you will find it in one, arti one article. Consider what an Islamic school can do with a resource like this. Consider what your son and daughter are going to university. Can, how, how can they benefit from this? In one article on Ansar, for example, there is a whole history of, of Al-Ansar. How they started, what, they did, did, what did they do? What was their relationship with the Prophet Islam? The prominent Ansar, their role in the preservation of the Quran. The article on Hijra, article on Sayyidina Abu Bakr Sadiq. All of these articles, the article on ablution, the article on beautiful names of Allah, small husna, with which this first volume ends, presents 1400 years of reflection of great scholars of Islam on these beautiful names, some of which were recited here at the beginning of this event, the last verse of Suratul Hashr. What is it the Prophet ﷺ told us about this beautiful name, small husna? In one article, in one place, with full references. Since the publication of this, we have had launches in Canada, in America, and now I'm very thankful to our brothers and sisters here at IPC and, and other brothers who have helped to organize this event. This is the first event in South Africa, which will be followed by, inshallah, uh, an event in Johannesburg and then in Cape Town. I've traveled from Canada all the way here, first of all, to be among you, to see this beautiful land where there is a community unlike any other community in the Muslim world or even outside the Muslim world. MashaAllah, uh, this is my second time in South Africa and I'm always so impressed by the energy, the sheer energy and the organization. These two things are distinct features of this community that I don't find in, in, in the Muslim world or anywhere else. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted you something unique for the Ummah. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve this community. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and increase you in deen, in iman, in the material and spiritual resources. I request tonight that we have only 50 copies here that you, if you can, take a copy home for yourself, for your children, for your colleagues, for non-Muslims who ask you questions about Islam, for your schools. This kind of work is a generational work. This is not a small effort, and this is not a one-time thing. If their terrible work can sustain 100 years, just imagine something based on haq, on truth, how long this impact will be, inshallah. And lastly, every one of you, I really sincerely and deeply request you to make dua for the acceptance of this effort by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the day when our deeds are going to be weighed. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept this effort from all of us who participate in this, in the making of this groundbreaking work for the first time, for the first time in contemporary history by Muslims. We don't need to let those who do not believe in the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell the world what this book is all about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so much. 
Look at the resources Allah he has given us. This thing has to turn, the tide has to turn, and it has to turn today. We cannot wait till tomorrow. Jazakumullah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you and reward you. Jazakumullah, Dr. Muzakar, for that brief presentation. I think I share uh, the hopes of everybody present over here that we all wish and pray for the success of this project and that it was much needed. And inshallah, maybe not in our lifetimes, we may sometimes realize things, but it may take sometimes longer than our own lifetime before uh, we, we, we see the fruits of our efforts. I will now open the floor for questions that we can direct to the Sheikh over here. Are these 600 articles that you're speaking about, are they articles which already exist from uh, other scholars and you're putting them together as, a, as an editor or have you, have you commissioned these from scholars or what's the thing? Iqbal Musa, okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Dr. Bez, you mentioned in your intro, uh, page six volumes. I just would like to ask uh, the uh, study uh, compared with the science and Quran. Can we can you learn the things from the volumes? My name is Mahmoud Bauda. I'm just uh, querying whether your work includes the chronological order of the Quran. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Abbas Sheikh. Uh, we need to know whether the Quran that is being is this the tafsir of the Quran, in other words? What, do, what has just been produced, is this the tafsir of our Quran? Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. The first question about uh, whether or not these articles have all been commissioned, these 600 articles that I mentioned, the answer is no. There is no text like this that is in existence right now. So every single thing is being written for this project by specialized uh, specialists in their field. Uh, on the website of the project, www.iequran.com, which you will find inside this book, the URL is there. Uh, you will find all the 600 articles listed according to alphabetical order and divided into the volumes. And they are being commissioned uh, right now uh, scholars, either we, we find a contact a scholar or people come to us and say, I want to contribute this, I've done research on this article. Uh, second, whether this is a comparative study uh, between Islam and science, that is only one aspect. Yes, there is actually an entry called the Quran and science, which deals uh, with that particular subject. Uh, whether or not uh, a chronology of the Quran is there, in fact, in the second volume, there is an article on the compilation of the Quran being written by one of the greatest scholars now living on the text of the Quran, Dr. Muhammad Mustafa Al-Azmi, who is in Riyadh, 89 year old, he's on a wheelchair. Three years ago, he published his lifelong findings in the form of a book called the Quran, the compilation of the Quran, history of the text of the Quran, from revelation to compilation. This is a wonderful book. And uh, his article, I just received an email, his article is due actually next week, inshallah. Uh, so that will be in the second volume. And finally, is this a tafsir? No, this is not a tafsir. Uh, tafsir of the Quran deals with verse by verse. This is like hundreds of taf tafasirs. And we extract the concentrate from this material and present it in an encyclopedic manner. Jazakallah khairan. I will go for a second round of questions if anybody wants to ask or add any more. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Rafiq Muhammad. Uh, first, I'd like to just uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Iqbal Saab for the wonderful initiative. My question is, uh, what is the response of uh, notable Islamic institutions to this work, how, how have they received it? That will be my question, Zakullah. Assalamu alaikum. I would like to ask uh, the guest, how many uh, researchers are working full time on this project? Zakullah. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, 
we want to know if when you read this book, do you need to have wudu, like a normal Quran? My name is Pak Ray. Because I come from a background where there is so much misconception about Islam. Misconception about Islam. And from the very little knowledge I have on Islam, the greatest threats to Muslims or the greatest threats to Islam are ignorant Muslims. This is not just going to be a question, but also a suggestion. You see, I would like to know the marketing strategy of this Encyclopedia 1, then also will advise that this Encyclopedia is made available in universities across the globe. Inshallah, we are going to play, we are going to end this uh, evening uh, with the, of course, with the, the sale of this uh, first volume, but before that, we are going to play a short video that I recorded uh, 10 days ago in Al-Aqsa. Uh, when uh, the Imam of uh, Al-Aqsa, Sheikh Abu Yusuf, uh, saw the first volume, uh, what did he say? So that is in response to this question about the response of the ulama or the institutions. But this is just one of s numerous responses which we have received on this first volume from a variety of uh, institutions and scholars, a variety meaning those who are in the university system, professors, and those who are uh, traditional ulama. And on our website, you can see uh, almost every single known Muslim scholar who has received a copy and what they have actually written back to us. On the website, there is a whole good description of that. Uh, second, uh, researchers, uh, there are three different levels of researchers working on this project. One is our editorial team, the core team that uh, is responsible for processing of the text that comes into the system. Every single article that comes into the system is first of all blindly reviewed by three scholars. Their comments go back to the author. The text is revised, and then once the text has been finalized, it goes through stages of copies.